You don't have to show any reverence to the gods of this world. You say, oh, but you have to respect all religions. You have to respect all opinions, all faiths, all ideas. No, you don't. How about human sacrifice religion? No, we don't respect that. How about Buddha religion? No, we don't respect that. You have to respect all beliefs. Yeah, how about Nazism? I don't respect that. Communism, I don't respect that either. We respect people. Even people who, re who believe those things, we respect them, but we don't respect the thing that's not of God. Think of the parable that Messiah gave of the unrighteous steward. The man, remember that? The man who's losing his job, and he responds by figuring out a way to keep on money coming in. And he's an opportunist, this guy. And, and, and Messiah says the children of this world are wiser in their ways than the children of the kingdom are. He's saying the worldly people are wiser in worldly things than the children of the kingdom are in things of the kingdom. And he commends the unrighteous servant, not because of his unrighteousness, but because of his wisdom and his shrewdness and his resourcefulness and making the most of every moment. And he tells the children of God, you should be more like him in that respect. Not immoral, not greedy, but wise, shrewd, resourceful, not for worldly things, but for the will of God, for the glory and the purposes and kingdom of God. Now keep that in mind to understand what he's doing right now because he's doing the same thing. He gives the example of a neighbor who's obnoxious, who goes and wakes you up at 12 in the morning because he wants some food for his company. Does he want you to be like that? Not in the, not in the bad way, but read on. I tell you, he goes on, I guess, verse 8, as I said, even if he won't get up and give him anything because he's a friend, he's, oh, well, he's a friend, but I'm not getting up for him. Because of this guy's shamelessness, impudence, He'll get up and give him as much as he needs. Not because he likes the guy much, or maybe he does, but, not because, but because the guy is so audacious, he's not going home. Or, or in some versions, it says because of his shameless audacity. So it goes on, verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door shall be opened. For everyone who asks, shall receive. Whoever who seeks shall find, and the one who knocks, the door will be open to them. What is the Lord saying? He's talking here about prayer and your relationship with God. He's likening it to a midnight neighbor's request, saying because of the neighbor's audacity, he's going to get what he asked for. He might not get it at first. He's, he's knocking, and they're saying, I'm not getting up. I'm, I'm asleep. I'm not going to. Keeps knocking and keeps knocking. So he's saying, don't give up. Often in prayer, you don't see things right away. Many, many times you don't. And there are times, listen, God can say no and he can say wait. But the, many times you don't see it and you might give up. And yet God sometimes doesn't answer us right away with that where it may be a yes, but because of building faith and perseverance. And times may go by and you might see, you know, it seems like it's over and you might give up, but it may not be something you're supposed to give up on. Zechariah or Zechariah, the father of John, John the Baptist, is in the temple. And the angel says to him, Zechariah, God has heard your prayers. Now think about it. Zechariah is old. You know, we think of Zechariah as the one who doubted, but he had a lot of faith before that. He's praying. It means that what, what the angel is saying is, Gabriel, you've been praying for this, Zechariah. You've been praying to have a child. Now, now he's long past. His wife is past the age of having a child. So they must have been praying for a long time. You know, when they got married, not long after they might have a child. When they were young and they got married, you know, younger than we do by an average. And so he must have been praying for a long time. Lord, we want a child. We want a child. We try. Now it's past. looks like it's all past. And the angel says, you've been praying. Now, now Zechariah had to be praying probably for years and years. And he says, God has heard your prayer. Now it's probably years later. God has heard. God has heard. You know, interesting because Zechariah's real name in Hebrew is Zachariah. Try it, Zachariah. Zachariah. That's where you get Zechariah from, or Zechariah. And here it says that his name means God has remembered. Now the angel just said God has heard, but the prayers were probably prayed a long time ago, and it, and his name means God has remembered. God doesn't forget the prayers says he has all this. He, has, he keeps it. 
Prayers go up to God like incense. Prayers you prayed years ago. He, you might have forgotten. He doesn't forget. God will not forget your prayers. You remember when, when Cornelius is praying up and all of a sudden the angel says, your prayers have ascended as a memorial. Like, like God has been watching you pray for years, Cornelius. And now God's going to answer it. So the parable goes right along with the famous words of God to you, Jesus to you, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened. Does that mean everything you ask for you'll get? No, it never says that. But you'll get something if you're asking in faith. God will give you either what you're asking for or what you need, which is better, but if it's not the same. The neighbor is asking, seeking, and knocking. And again, it's all about prayer. So this must be, you know, it's, this must be an important thing. Now, now the, the Greek tense, some of you may know, some of you may not know, when he says, ask and it shall be given, you know, seek and you'll find. The, the Greek tense in the Bible is not ask and you'll receive. It's in asking or in continuous asking you shall receive. In seeking, not just seek, but in seeking God or in continuous seeking you will find. And in not just knock, but in knocking, knocking, knocking. You ever knock on a door for a long time? You shall be given. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. If you don't know it's a no, it might be a no, that's fine. You accept it from the Lord. But then say, Lord, give me your will. Because God has something better. Keep seeking. You know, in my house, I'm often downstairs. And someone's knocking, someone knocks on the door. I have to you know, break from what I'm doing. I got to run, get up the stairs, go up there, go, you know, and as soon as I get there and they're gone, they gave up. Or maybe, the, you know, maybe it's happened to you. Somebody's knocking at the door and you can, you can raise your hand in a moment if I'm going to ask you and you're not fully presentable. <laughs> you're not fully dressed. Has that ever happened to anybody here? Yeah. And so, so, and the thing is that, that you get yourself quickly, you're getting on the thing, you're getting yourself ready, and you run down, and sometimes they're not, they couldn't wait, they're away. And, you know, you can pray, and you don't see the answer, and you give up, and yet the answer could be on its way. It says, keep on. This whole parable here is against the idea that you just ask once, and you seek once, and you, you knock once, although there may be times God does that, but that's not the, the normal thing here. The point here is he kept, he kept, the guy was shameless. He just didn't matter that they were sleeping, didn't matter they were in the bed. He just kept doing it. And because he kept doing it, he, he was answered. That's what Jesus is telling you. That's what Messiah is telling you. First, it's got to be God's will. We know that. First, it's got to be God's will. But, and it's gotta be, and, and, but if it is, and if you're not sure, you just seek, Lord, that or something that is your will. Now, it's important that, again, that original word that he uses to describe that neighbor, again, it can mean without modesty. The guy has no modesty, has no shame, shameless. How could he commend this guy? It all depends what it's about. It depends. When you're asking, when you're seeking God, is it just about your will and not submitted to his will? That's, that doesn't guarantee an answer. It's when it is the will of God and when you're also, when you're doing it for God's purpose and glory, whatever you're asking, doesn't mean it can't be something you enjoy, but you're doing it for God, he's going to honor that one way or the other. If you're just doing it for selfish means and, the th and that motive isn't right, that, that don't expect it. But you think, wait, shamelessness is not of God. Without shame? Have you no shame? We have a culture that has no shame. Wait a minute, but what did Paul say? I am not ashamed. So there is a godly shamelessness. And there's a good shamefulness when you have sinned and you're ashamed and you repent and move on with God. Good. That's a good shame. You don't stay in it, but it leads you back. When it comes to sin, shame can, shame can be a lifesaver because it can lead to repentance and salvation. But when it comes to the gospel, the things of God, shame is not a good thing. You should not be ashamed of God. You should not be ashamed of the name of Messiah, Jesus. And especially in a culture that wants you to be ashamed, you have to be like Paul saying, I am not ashamed. Amen. I am not ashamed of the gospel. And he, because he, he was in a culture that was like ours in many ways. It was anti-God. 
And we're watching this culture become increasingly like that. So he said, right to the Roman world, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew and the Gentile. So there is a godly shamelessness. There is, and this Greek word also, ha, about the, it also could be translated with no reverence. No reverence. Wait a minute. Reverence is good. We're supposed to be reverent, right? You know, you know we, we call ministers reverend. That means reverence. That's from reverence. Yes, to the things of God we show reverence, but not for other things. In other words, we don't show, you're not to show any reverence to sin. You're not to show any reverence to the gods of this world. You say, oh, but you have to respect all religions. You have to respect all opinions, all faiths, all ideas. No, you don't. How about human sacrifice religion? No, we don't respect that. How about Buddha religion? No, we don't respect that. You have to respect all beliefs. Yeah, how about Nazism? I don't respect that. Communism, I don't respect that either. We respect people. Even people who, re who believe those things, we respect them, but we don't respect the thing that's not of God. There's a Holy Spirit boldness. You know, in, in, in Exodus, when they're, they go, you know, they're, the time of the Red Sea, they sing that song of the Lord, and it says the, in, in Hebrew, the Lord is my strength, or the Lord is my oz, the word for strength, oz. My Lord is, but it also means boldness. The Lord is my boldness. You know, strength and boldness go together. A person who's bold in the Lord is going to be strong in the Lord. I'm not saying bold in their ego in the Lord. Bold in the Lord, they will be strong in the Lord. Listen to this proverb. Proverbs 28, it says this, verse 1. The wicked flee when nobody's pursuing them. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. Bold as a lion. Why? Messiah is a lion. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's a lion. Messiah is also a lamb. Behold the lamb of God. Why both? A lamb represents his nature. Good, pure, sacrifice, giving, love, blameless, lion. That's a, that's a lamb. Lion, power, might, almighty, king. God is good, righteous, love, lamb. But he's also powerful, mighty, the king of kings. Lion. Needs to be both. Needs to be both. You know, it's not a lion without a lamb, and it's not a lamb without a lion. God is love. L lamb. But love cannot be weak. Lion. Or it's not love. It's not going to be good. God is good all the time. Lamb. Pure. But goodness has to be strong like a lion. You don't want goodness to be weak. You don't, want, you don't want love to lack strength. You don't want God's mercy to be weak. You don't want God's protection to be weak. You want God, you want love to be almighty. You want goodness to be the king. You want the lamb to be the lion and the lion to be the lamb. That's Messiah. He came first as the lamb. He's coming the second time as the lion. That is the nature of God, and, it's, and you are of God. You're a child of God. You're a, you're a disciple of Messiah, so you have to have the nature of the lion and the lamb too. What, what's that? The lamb, you are to be righteous, good, pure, giving, everything that's good and beautiful. You are to be like that. But you're also to be strong like the lion. Because if you're good, but you're not strong, then your goodness is going to be weak. If you're loving, but you're not strong, your love is not going to last. If you're righteous, but the righteousness is not powerful, then your righteousness is going to be wiped away. It's not going to be able to hold. If you've got faith, but your faith isn't strong, what good will your faith be? So you also strong, bold, so that your goodness will not be overpowered by the darkness. You'll not be swept away by the culture or the crowd or the media because you're strong in the goodness of God. 
The righteous are, are as bold as a lion. You don't want to be bold as a lion without being good like the lamb. You don't want to be, you know, there are people who are just, just not good, who are just, they may be strong, but they're not loving. And there's those who are loving and they're not strong. You need to be both. The lion and the lamb. Goodness and power. Goodness and persevering in goodness. Now the word in Hebrew there in that proverb for what the righteous are. The righteous are as blank as a lion. The word is actually batach. Try it. What it actually means is it, yeah, it could be translated as strength, but it actually, it actually means confidence, trust, and faith. The righteous are as confident as a lion. The key of your strength is in your faith. How much you trust God, how much you will believe God, you'll choose to believe God, how much you'll be confident, that's how strong you'll be. The righteous are as confident as a lion, as bold as a lion, as audacious as a lion. In the New Testament, there's a similar word in Greek, the words use the word paresia, which means bold, frank, blunt. It's commended of God. In Ephesians 6, Paul says, you know, that I might open my mouth boldly with, with this word, with this boldness, with this, this bluntness. The word appears in Hebrews 4. You know, where it, you know where it appears? Verse 16, it says, let us come boldly, audaciously. Let us come with blood. Let us come full blast to the throne of God. The righteous saints of God are to have this quality. Abraham had it. You know, in the, in the, in the, in the Jewish, or I'd say Hebrew, but it's kind of Yiddish, Hebrew. They, they'd call this, they have a word for this called chutzpah. And you could say in some of the language, you've got some nerve. But it's a good one. Abraham is bargaining with God. God says, I have to bring judgment. Abraham says, well, listen, I, I, may I say something here? Will you spare them for, you know, it goes down the line, 40 people, 30 people. Will you spare, you know, I don't want to cause a problem, but can you, would you spare, he's, he's trying to teach God to be merciful in his mind. He's a little bit like Peter, but he's, he has a heart to try to save people. At the end, he said, will the judge of the earth do justly? And God tells him, yes, even for 10 people, I would spare the entire city. Jacob is wrestling with the angel. And what happens at the end of that wrestling match? He doesn't really, it's hard to say whether he wins or not because he, he struck down, but he wins by clinging on to the angel. And what does he do? He says, I will not let you go until you bless me. That, that is audacity. That's bold audacity. You see it, you know what it says? It says in Acts, they looked at the apostles and they saw what? They saw the spirituality. Well, maybe they saw the, the knowledge of the scripture, maybe. But it says they, when they saw the boldness, the audacity of them, the, the, the fearlessness, the shamelessness filled with the spirit, they, they, didn't, they didn't know what to do. They were so filled with the spirit. And the result of the spirit was a boldness. After Pentecost, the Spirit is linked to boldness. Moses before Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh is a god back then. Pharaoh's the most powerful man in the world. Moses has no power in the earthly realm. He enters the palace and says, let my people go. That is nerve. To the king, the Pharaoh of Egypt, he's, got, he's the head of the slave nation, and he says, God says, thus says the Lord, let my people go. He's not intimidated. He's going in the power of God. Gideon, hero of God, hero of faith. He comes to God and he asks him, all right, if this is you, make the fleece wet and the ground dry. Make the ground wet and the fleece dry. It goes back and forth. That is, that is nerve to do, go to God. God told him, but he had faith. It was based on the fact that he wanted to do God's will, but he wanted to make sure that this was God's will. But he had that. God honored it because of his faith. There was, I've mentioned Richard Wormbrand, man who went to, his, to the prisons of Romania for his faith under the communists. 
And he's interrogated. They're, they'd interrogate the prisoners again and again and interrogate. Wake them up in the middle of the night not to get bread. To interrogate them. To, to make them talk. Make them give up other people. Interrogate, interrogate. At one moment, this thing came over and he said, he said to the interrogator, he says, wait a minute. He says, I want to. He says, what? He says, I want to interrogate you now. The guy says, what? And he starts interrogating. He, he, start, he says, you're crazy. He starts asking him questions. But he ends up leading the guy to the Lord because of his audacity. That was a Holy Spirit audacity. When I was asked to go into ministry, I needed to know from God, full time, I needed to know from God that this was, Lord, this is you. And I, I remember, you know, I've heard, you know, believers say you shouldn't put a fleece before God. You shouldn't put a fleece before God. You know, that's like what Gideon did. You put the thing and say, do this, if this, and you know, you have to be careful. Be, the Bible doesn't actually say you shouldn't do it. doesn't say do it either. But I said, you know, people say I shouldn't do it, Lord, so I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to put a fleece before you. I'm going to put six fleeces before you. And you have the end of the month if you want me to say yes. By the end of the month, everything I said, he did. Now, I'm not telling you to do that. That was one. But the reason why, I'm not recommending that. He doesn't have to do anything. But it was bold. It was audacity. And God honored it because he knew my faith was, Lord, if this is you, I'll do it. I was seeking his will. And he honored the audacity of it. Ruth is told by Naomi, with, along with Orpah, go home, girls. Go home. Go back to your land. There's no future for you in Israel. Go home. Be blessed. And it says, but Ruth clung. She would not let go. She would not let go of Naomi. And she, she, says, she says, do not, not only does he, he get, you know, because we, we hear this as poetry, so we don't always get what's happening here. She, Naomi's saying, go, go away. And she says, don't even ask me to go. Do not even ask, not just I'm not going, don't even ask me again. Because wherever you go, I'm going. Stubborn. Stubborn. Chutzpah. Audacity. And God honored it. And later on, that same audacity goes down to the threshing floor while Boaz is asleep and comes to him and it says, behold, one of the understatements of the Bible says, and, and, and Boaz woke and, and behold a woman. Well, this woman, she's right there. She says, spread your cloak over me because you are a kinsman redeemer. That's, that is audacity. Bold. For the woman to say, just spread it over. You're going to become my husband or become my husband. Take me. Take me into your covering here. But she was basing it on a law that God had given. She's being bold for God. She's going full blast with God. Look at David. You want to see somebody with boldness and somebody who has audacity? Here is one. He's a shepherd boy. And the whole, the whole nation is shivering under the, the shadow of Goliath. But he says, listen, I don't care. You guys shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be afraid. You're of Israel. Don't you know it? I'm going to stand against the giant. Not only is that bold and brazen, brash, but when he's standing in front of the giant, Goliath says, come on, come on, little boy. I'm going to give, you, I'm going to give your body to the birds today. And David responds, I'm paraphrasing, oh yeah, really? He says, you know, you stand there in the name of this, but I stand in the name of the Lord my God. And today he's going to give me, going to give me you today, giant. And he runs to him. And God honors it. Because he honors the, the courage and the boldness of faith. Elijah on Mount Carmel. There's a drought and he stands there before the prophets of Baal. One man against hundreds of men and a whole nation on that. And he, he shows no reverence. Same, same trait. No reverence to Baal. He's the one, I'm not going to go, but he's the one who, who mocks Baal. Really, where is he, guys? Where is your God? Where is he? He's, he's shout louder. He's not hearing you. Shout him. And he's sarcastic. You read that? This is a sarcastic man. And he might be teetering on the edge of obnoxiousness, but it's holy. He has them fill up the altar with water. Because fire is, the, they're saying, whoever the true God, let fire come. And he fills it up with water just to make it harder. Bold as a lion. This is Jonathan Kahn. Thanks for watching. And the Josiah Manifesto, the ancient mystery and guide for the end times, is available everywhere on Amazon, wherever books are sold. God bless you. Shalom.